The American Congressional Exchange is a program that we have that BPC started where we bring two members together, a Republican and a Democrat from two very different parts of the country, and we have them visit each individual's districts and really get to know not only that member, but also that district. Now, up until that trip, I did not know David Trone. And because of his willingness to make the trip, to come out, to spend that time with me, I can testify that I now have a friend and an ally on many issues of mutual concern. Many of us share the same principles and we bring to the table different life experiences, different political perspectives. We shouldn't find that dangerous or divisive. We should find it something to celebrate. And this is how America works, is by coming together, rolling up our sleeves, getting away from the partisanship, getting away from the rhetoric, and getting back to just delivering. When you have a conversation with people, and you have, and you laugh, and you get to know them, you no longer see them in the same light, and you're much more willing to say, let's figure out how we can be friends and really find solutions. It creates a different type of dialogue and friendship that exists, and it also allows those members to see how different different parts of the country are and how many similarities there are. Good morning and thank you for joining us for this live discussion on the state of mental health in the US. According to the most recent data from the NIH, more than 57 million Americans are living with a mental illness. That's just over one in five. Despite its prevalence, it can remain out of sight for too many, a stigma, and despite medical advances far too often, it is left untreated. This week, we saw Senator John Fetterman return to work on Capitol Hill after being hospitalized for depression. His candid remarks about the experience received praise from his colleagues and the public. It reminded us of the toll mental illness can take and the stigma that continues to be attached to it. This is not a political issue. It is not defined by your point of view or where you live. At the Bipartisan Policy Center, this is one of the many issues we focus on. We've published detailed reports with policy recommendations on a shortage of mental health care professionals, how telehealth can help in treatment in the nationwide 988 suicide and crisis line. And we're working on a new report on ways to improve mental health services, particularly in rural America. To talk about these issues and more today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Jerome Adams, who served as U.S. Surgeon General and is now Executive Director of Health Equity Initiatives at Purdue University. Throughout his career, he's been a public voice on mental health, substance abuse, suicide prevention, and access to care. He'll be joined by Ritu Chatterjee, who focuses on mental health issues for NPR. This discussion is just ahead, but first we'll have a special message from Representative David Trone of Maryland, who serves as the co-chair of the Bipartisan Addiction and Mental Health Task Force. Hi, everyone. I'm Congressman David Trone from Maryland 6th District. Thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting this event and normalizing conversations around mental health. America's mental health crisis only continues to grow. One in five U.S. adults live with mental illness and suicide is a leading cause of death in America, over 50,000. In Congress, my number one priority is get folks fighting mental illness or substance use disorder, the resources and the support they need. That's why I founded the Bipartisan Mental Health and Substance Use Disorder Task Force to bring attention to a national crisis and move the ball forward on finding solutions. You know more than anyone that the only way to make real progress in this fight is work together. We must be bipartisan. Mental health doesn't care if you're a Dem, or Republican, liberal or conservative, it touches every family and every community. We need to ensure that we have all the resources needed to respond to folks in crisis and equip those on the front lines to save lives. 
I'm proud to say I'm working with over 130 members every day to take action on this issue. Last year, we introduced over 100 bills to combat addiction and mental health, all bipartisan, all. The 26th became law. We passed the largest investment in addiction and mental health ever in the annual government funding bill. The Restoring Hope for Mental Health and Wellbeing Act is a package of 30 mental health and addiction bills, eight of which I led, all bipartisan. Further, last year we launched the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, or 988, so that folks in crisis can get connected to trained counselor for free, confidential, 24 seven hour, 24 seven day support. We also need to provide mental health care before it gets to that point. So we passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, investing 11 billion in student mental health programs, including early intervention programs, school-based mental health and wraparound services, and improvement to school safety. Yet even as we take these major steps, many people still face the stigma surrounding mental health. This poses a significant barrier to assessing proper care. I commend my colleague, Senator John Fetterman. Senator Fetterman, great, great leadership for putting himself first and being an inspiration to so many Americans. Our message to America must be, it's okay not to be okay. Mental illness isn't a failure of character, it's a disease that can and should be treated just like cancer. Together from local, state, and federal levels, we must continue, work across the aisle, build a nationwide coalition, and invest in community-based services. Thank you for joining me in this mission. We have to win. Take care. Thank you, uh, Congressman Trone, for those remarks, which actually set up uh, our conversation with Dr. Jerome Adams really well. Uh, and I do want to point out that we will be taking viewer questions uh, today. If you want to submit questions using, you can use the live chat on YouTube, or uh, you can do it on Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live. Dr. Adams, thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to start with uh, sort of your personal uh, perspective, like when and how did you start to see and understand mental health as a public health issue? Well, that's a great question to start on. And I want to say thank you to you and thank you to uh, the BPC for having us here for this incredibly important and timely conversation. And uh, as a educator and uh, former Surgeon General, I don't want to assume anything. So I want to just start off by defining mental health. I think it's important that people understand that mental health, it includes our emotional, our psychological, and our social well-being. And it's a spectrum. Uh, far too often when we talk about mental health, what people think about or what we're really talking about is mental illness. But that's just one spectrum. Uh, there are many people who have mental health issues and or who are paying attention to their mental health uh, without having a diagnosed mental illness. And it's important to understand that mental fitness is just as important as physical fitness. We can build up our mental health strength just as we can build up our physical health strength. Now, um, to the question you asked, um, my story is like many others. Uh, it's been very personal. So uh, I have experienced mental health um, through my family, um, through my role as a physician, and also through my role as a, a public policymaker. From a familial point of view, many of your uh, viewers may remember that while I was Surgeon General of the United States, I spoke very publicly of the fact that my brother uh, was in a prison cell about 25 miles away from the District of Columbia due to crimes he committed to support his addiction. And I speak about his story with his permission, uh, but uh, it's important to understand that substance misuse is part of that spectrum of mental health issues. And it's something I've seen up close and personal with many members of my family. 
I also have uh, close family members who've dealt with depression and anxiety. And uh, you heard Congressman Trone talk about stigma. That stigma has really, I think, um, limited uh, their willingness as, uh, and for many Americans, uh, the willingness to to talk about these issues, to even acknowledge that they are issues, and uh, to receive treatment for those issues. So that's the personal side of things. As a physician, I'm in the hospital today working. I've seen far too many patients come in with physical health issues that really are manifestations of unrecognized and untreated mental health issues. I work. Can in you give us an example? I'll give you an example. I work in a level one trauma center. And uh, far too often, we see domestic violence cases, we see suicide attempts, uh, we see drug overdoses, we see uh, gang-related shootings that can be traced back to unrecognized and untreated anxiety, unrecognized and untreated depression, um, bipolar disorder, um, issues that if we had recognized them earlier or even prevented them earlier, and prevention is possible in many cases, we wouldn't have had these uh, horrific physical manifestations of these issues. And, and then finally, I, I saw these issues as a public policymaker, as both an Indiana State Health Commissioner, where in Scott County, Indiana, we had the largest HIV outbreak related to injection drug use in the history of the United States. Once again, a, a uh, public policy issue. Many people remember me as the person who helped legalize syringe service programs, both in Indiana and then in many other rural and um, and uh, conservative states, but that was necessary because we didn't recognize and treat um, and intervene early enough with the substance misuse issues that in many cases were manifestations of uh, untreated um, upstream mental health issues. So again, in many different ways, I've been involved, and I think that reflects the reality for uh, many across America. <laughs> So the, the, you brought up the issue of stigma, and so did Kelly and Congressman Schoen, which because it's just so uh, important. And the pandemic did do away with a lot of the stigma, right? Just because, as you say, like a lot, many, many more people were experiencing some sort of psychological distress during the pandemic. Um, you know, we hear about mental health a lot more in the media now. Um, do you think we've really done away with it, or? Is there more still uh, more works uh, still to be done? Well, that is a great question, and you bring up a, an important point. The pandemic uh, was certainly a a once in a century crisis, and crisis often brings with it opportunity. Uh, the uh, the pandemic brought with us the opportunity to openly deal with uh, many of the uh, mental health issues that people across America are facing, and which were exacerbated by the isolation of the pandemic, by the financial difficulties brought on by the pandemic, um, by uh, a lot of the uh, uh, exposure to substances of misuse that increased during the pandemic, including alcohol. We saw that skyrocket, alcohol misuse um, skyrocket. Uh, but I spend a lot of time now with college students. I was at Indiana University last week talking to students. I was at Ball State um, just yesterday talking to students. And uh, I, I also think we have to give credit to the young people out there. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is they are in a very different place than what you and I were when we went to college. They talk very openly about their mental health um, issues and mental fitness, as I mentioned, strengthening the mental health, understanding resilience, understanding how to recognize when you're having an issue, but also understanding what you need to do as an individual uh, to uh, help yourself get through tough times. So kudos to them. I think that as much as anything has changed the way that we view mental health. But to answer your question, we have not even come close to doing away with stigma, uh, particularly in uh, certain communities. So uh, we know that certain communities are at higher risk for mental health issues. Uh, uh, I'll name a couple. Military and veterans, higher risk for suicidality, higher risk for mental health issues. LGBTQ community, higher risk for mental health issues because of the stress and stigma they're subjected to. Um, people of color in marginalized communities, higher risk for mental health issues. And a lot of this comes back to stigma, stigma that society places on these individuals, stigma from the cultures that these individuals exist in. Um, and we need to uh, 
aggressively work to lower stigma. It's one of the reasons that I talk openly about my family's situation, because uh, people hearing that the U.S. Surgeon General is not immune to uh, having to deal with mental health issues and mental health crises amongst family members, I think really gives people permission to talk about these things. One of the most heartening things for me when I was Surgeon General was after a speech when people from the audience would come up and say, you know, that's happening to my family too. That's something I've dealt with and I've never talked about it before. So as a, a Representative Crone said, we need to normalize the idea that it's okay not to be okay. We need to be more like our younger people and openly talk about these issues. And we can't assume that because we've made progress that uh, we've reached the finish line. We have a lot further to go in terms of addressing stigma. So related to this and what you said about uh, young people being, you know, having far less stigma, being much more open to talking about mental health, much more aware of their own mental health. Um, but we also know from the data um, that young people, adolescents, um, young adults are and sort of, you have the highest rate of rates of uh, mental health symptoms among them. And you have more people, as it should be, seeking help. But that help is often hard to access. Now, 988 um, made huge strides in making it okay for people to seek help. There was, you know, there's been historic levels of investments into 988, not just supporting the line, but also in many communities, services. Um, related to it, but, you know, and we know more people are reaching out in just like less than a year. But I often hear that for these crisis counselors who are providing this free and very valuable service when it comes to connecting people to care, ongoing care in their community, that's still such a big challenge. Wait times are high. I mean, it's hard even in well-resourced, urban areas with a high concentration of mental health providers, you know, and things in rural areas are are far, far worse, where you don't have providers for like miles and miles and miles. Um, what are your thoughts on how do we how do we improve access to care? How do we and access to care at many levels? You know, you talked about uh, just being in the ER and uh, treating patients who, ha had they been treated earlier, wouldn't have, things wouldn't have escalated. Um, so we need sort of a whole, you know, sort of uh, continuum of care. That's that's the, I guess, term people people use. Yes, yes. So so um, you you bring up a critically uh, well several critically important points. And and again, I don't want to assume. So for our listeners and our viewers, I want you to know that. 988 is the National Suicide and Crisis Line. It was launched in July of last year. Prior to 988, there wasn't one number that people could call if they needed help or if they were in crisis. And far too often, uh, people were forced to call 911. Um, and I say forced, um, not pejoratively. 911 does great work, but it is not a mental health crisis response line. Um, and and most cases, if you called 911, you ended up in one of two places, the emergency room or the jail cell. And we know that neither of those places is an ideal place for people who are having a mental health crisis to be. So 988 was an historic move forward. It was uh, something that was initially um, <clears throat> approved by the Trump administration and was ultimately funded and brought across the finish line by the Biden administration. So uh, just as the BPC does bipartisan work, this is something that had bipartisan support. But as part of the BPC's effort to promote 988, we emphasized that uh, we needed three things in order to make this optimally um, uh, effective for the public. We needed better interagency collaboration, uh, we know that often the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. People work in silos in the mental health um, world. And so uh, we need better interagency collaboration at a state and local and federal level. Um, we need to increase the behavioral health workforce, as you mentioned, Ritu, um, because what we don't want is for someone to call 988 in crisis 
and then not be able to get the help that they need. They will lose trust and faith in the system and it won't um, help anyone. And we also need financing. And I say this very directly because I know we have policymakers listening into our conversation today. We need to finance mental health uh, in the same ways that we finance um, physical health in our uh, in our um, in our medical systems and our healthcare systems. Um, now, uh, I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive on the workforce issue that you brought up because that's huge. It's huge, um, but we again have many opportunities. We saw a 7,000% increase in telehealth services during the pandemic. Uh, and most of that increase happened in the behavioral health areas. So we can leverage new technologies to uh, expand our behavioral health workforce. Uh, the important caveat there is that studies show that most of that increase in telehealth occurred in urban and affluent areas. So we have the potential to increase access, but there's also the potential to increase disparities if we don't maintain an equity focus to, um, uh, to our utilization of these new technologies that not everyone has access to. Uh, we also need to look at um, alternative providers. So at Purdue University, where I work, we are training mental health nurse practitioners. Uh, we need to better utilize social workers, um, and psychologists, uh, because not everyone uh, can see or needs to see an MD psychiatrist to get their issues dealt with. And we need better research. And I think um, policymakers can help fund research on models that allow us to, uh, to appropriately um, stratify and triage patients so that we can understand, okay, you really do need to see a psychiatrist right now versus your issues are issues that are best dealt with by a social worker or by uh, uh, even a community health worker um, who, can, who can really get to know you and some of the social drivers for the issues that you're dealing with. So a lot um, in that question that you asked, 988 is an important start we have opportunities and wind in our sails because of the pandemic um, and because of some of the efforts that Congress has been leaning into, but a lot more work to do to increase the behavioral health workforce, increase collaboration, and make sure we're appropriately funding mental health in a way that will allow everyone to get the care they need, when they need it, where they need it. I just want to add a quick uh, a little note on the community health worker bit. There was there have been very successful trials done in India with um, the so-called ASHA workers or community health workers, and um, and they have been trained to provide like a brief psychotherapy, um, uh, brief and ongoing um, to people in the communities. And it's been found to be very, very successful. And it's now I think they're doing trials um, uh, in the US as well using that model. Um, and also peer, uh, uh, peer support people, right? Yes. Last year, I did a story on um, peer on recovery support specialist, I remember yeah. it was a wonderful story. And that is a best practice for you to having people with lived experience, whether it's with substance use or people who've attempted to uh, take their lives before by suicide or people who have a uh, another mental health diagnosis, uh, that peer support is a best practice. And the example in India that you talked about is uh, a concept that we uh, refer to as SBIRT, screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment. And you can train anyone from a teacher to a police officer or a firefighter, um, all the way up to a primary care physician to intervene in an expert manner. You, you have to help them understand how to recognize a problem. So screening, mm -hmm. a brief intervention, um, there are things that we can do right in that moment to help people deal with the acute crisis and then referral to treatment, getting them to appropriate long-term care. So again, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. There are things that we all can do if properly resourced, educated, and empowered to uh, to help individuals. Again, we're, we will never be able to produce enough psychiatrists yeah. so that everyone can see uh, see a, a, an MD specializing in mental health when they need it. But we've got to lean on uh, the full array of, of of talent out there and increase our workforce um, by uh, increasing the number of people who we see as potential interveners. 
Can you also talk a little bit about prevention, which you brought up earlier? Um, you know, there have been recent sort of um, uh, recommendations made to healthcare providers to screen early, like screen kids as early as eight for anxiety, for example, um, screen teens for depression and suicide. Um, so what is the role of prevention and what are the battery of sort of tools out there with early prevention? Because right now we know that the gap between starting to show symptoms and actually connecting to care is huge, like years, sometimes over a decade. Well, well, now you're speaking to my heart. So I am a physician. I work in a level one trauma center, and I absolutely want to be there as the safety net for folks when they are in crisis. But there will always be more people who need care than I or the system can take care of as long as we're in this crisis response mindset. And so what we really need to do is figure out how we can get upstream and prevent some of these problems before they become crises. Uh, and, and so you say, what can we do? Well, there's a number of things that, that we can do. Um, we can uh, do a better job of integrating uh, uh, mental health services into primary care practices. Just as we screen you for blood pressure and uh, screen you for diabetes, we should be screening you at every visit for mental health issues so that we can intervene before it becomes a crisis. But you can even get upstream of the doctor's office. We know in school settings, when we uh, train and empower school teachers to recognize issues, uh, they can um, ward off negative problems, including um, sometimes school shootings, suicides, uh, bullying. Um, we know that um, even better is being able to have mental health practitioners, social workers available to schools. And now with telehealth, we can make that more available if we fund it to schools without having to have a physical person on site. The teacher recognizes and then they can uh, set up a telehealth visit for that student and or their family. But even upstream from that, there are these things we too called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. These are negative events that occur to someone when they're young, and it could include losing a caregiver as over 250,000 people have uh, have had happened to them during COVID. It can include abuse at home. Um, it can it can include seeing someone get shot as far too many of our urban young people have had occur to them. But uh, recognizing and screening people for ACEs so that then we can intervene. And there are good studies that show that you actually can intervene uh, when someone has a high ACE score and you prevent mental health issues. And that is what a true public health approach to mental health is. It's not just treatment, 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 which we're rightly focused on, but we're never going to solve the problem um, by looking solely through that framing. Um, and it's getting as far upstream as we can to prevent problems before they occur or before they worsen. That, that's what I think we need to do a better job of. And I hope policymakers will look at, at that. We've even, uh, one more thing I want to mention, just because we've been talking a lot about guns. Um, uh, we know that simply creating um, communities that people want to live in, greening, it's called greening of communities, uh, cleaning up graffiti, uh, putting in parks and green spaces, that lowers the violence in a community because it improves people's morale. It makes them want to protect their community. And uh, you end up getting big community buy-in and less violence. So there are all sorts of things that if we chose to fund could help lower mental health issues and the negative manifestations on the back end. And you and you brought up the green thing. There's been some wonderful um uh, 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 studies in Philadelphia that I've covered that also look at how greening lowers rates of depression in the community. Exactly. You know, turning turning empty lots um, into sort of parks and green areas is a huge impact on community levels Murals of uh, depression. And, you know, people can see a, a mural that represents their community and makes them feel pride in their Proud. community, as opposed to uh, as opposed to broken glass. And uh, you know, and 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 other things. So um, again, incredibly important. And you're lifting those things up. We need our policymakers to listen and to fund those efforts because the evidence shows they actually do work. Yeah. 
Um, and clearly, the, you t you brought brought up schools, and it's the one advantage or the one good thing that came out of the pandemic is I think schools have recognized just how pivotal a role they play in on the prevention side, early identification side, and that's already starting to happen. Um, you know, I just I have a three year old, and we just went to tour his pre K um, here in DC, and a parent who was there with us like asked the teacher who was giving the tour, like, what are you guys doing for social emotional learning mm -hmm. um, as early? And, you know, they're doing that with uh, at the daycare that my son goes to. So that's already happening. And that's that's a good change that I should uh, should bring up. Um, it but is a good change, Ritu. But again, um, I, I am the director of health equity at Purdue University. Health equity is something I'm passionate about. And uh, as you mentioned, at the places where you and I send our kids, yeah. they're doing these things. And that is an important start, but we need to make sure the funding and the resources are there so yes. that everyone has access to these services. Because uh, one of the challenges, both my parents are retired school teachers. They can tell you that it's uh, far back, and they're both in the, approaching 80 years old. They've been dealing with these mental health issues um, for as long as there have been children. Um, it, it hasn't been recognized, it hasn't been acknowledged, but in many cases, we rely on our teachers to be social workers, to be police officers, to be counselors, to be sometimes de facto physicians, and we need to properly resource and fund schools and not just put it all on the teacher to do it, particularly in marginalized and poorly resourced yeah. communities, or else, again, we'll continue to see these disparities grow, even as um, uh, we see places that are more resourced take on a more enlightened and inclusive approach. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I've seen in my reporting is like schools that are getting the schools uh, districts that are getting the recently allotted funding to improve mental health care and prevention in schools are often the bigger urban districts with some resources to even apply for the grants and get them. Uh, but that, you know, schools, again, uh, reaching people where they are, kids where they are. Uh, another place that people are uh, with adults is their workplace. Mm -hmm. And there's a question that came in um, from a, a viewer uh, is what about employers' roles in managing mental health and well-being in the workplace? Well, thank you, viewer, for that question. Uh, when I was Surgeon General, I put out a first-of-its-kind report called Community Health and Economic Prosperity. And the premise of that report was that we spend twice as much uh, as as the OECD average on healthcare, about $12,000 per capita in the US, but yet we get consistently poor outside the top 20 rankings on health. And part of the reason is because we are not investing in mental health and you can't be physically healthy if you're not mentally healthy. And you're not gonna be compliant with your diabetes care. You're not gonna be um, compliant with your hypertension medications if you've got crippling depression or anxiety. And so I've worked with the National Business Group on Health, with the UVA Darden School of Business, um, and with the Kelly School of Business, um, with many others, to make the case to businesses that you need to invest in communities that are supportive of people's mental health from, um, from beginning to end. And this includes making sure the plans that you're covering are, uh, are leaning into parity. Uh, parity means that insurers need to cover mental health issues to the same degree that they cover physical health issues and there are laws in place, but there are many loopholes in the law, there are many gaps. Uh, regardless of the law, I want businesses to understand it matters to your bottom line if your workforce is mentally unwell or unfit. People are more likely to miss work. You're more likely to have workplace incidents. And unfortunately, we've seen some of those play out in a tragic manner recently um, in the news. And uh, you're not going to have uh, a, a good pool in your community from which to pull from at a time when uh, there's a workforce crisis in this country. So uh, I completely agree. Uh, we need to bring employers and businesses to the table as we talk about these tough issues, because uh, let's face it, there are three gorillas in the room, Medicare, Medicaid, and um, employer-provided insurance. And we need all three there looking at how can we rebuild a, a system that isn't functioning uh, well right now, and how can we appropriately fund mental health to the same degree that we would fund someone who has a broken ankle or a back issue? 
So I want to stay with the parity uh, issue um, because, uh, you know, it comes up so often and it's such such a big issue. So I just this week, I had a story on uh, NPR's Morning Edition about a highly suicidal teenager. A, it took her family two years to find her the most evidence-based um, effective treatment, uh, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. She was in treatment um, and, you know, Treatment takes time. Yes. Um, and two, at about two months, just as she's starting to make improvements, starting to feel better, although she's still suicidal, having suicidal thoughts, but um, insurance cuts her off. They're like, nope, mm -hmm. it's time to move you to a lower level of care. Despite the fact that there was plenty of evidence switching her between different levels of care has been, was very harmful for her. Um, and against the treating psychiatrist's uh, advice, the insurance cut her off. And this is mm -hmm. just far too common. Um, and as several experts have told me, you know, consider a cancer patient, consider, a, you know, patient who's had a heart attack. If they still, they're starting to get better, but if they still have symptoms, it you, you would be hard pressed to find an insurance would as easily tell the patient or tell the doctors, we're not going to cover care anymore. They got to go home and start taking aspirin. Exactly. Right. Um, so that's one aspect of parity where you don't, again, like there are parity laws that say insurance companies have to cover mental health and physical health just the same, but it's not happening. And like insurance companies are routinely violating these, uh, the federal law and many state laws. And the other aspect of parity is just that providers aren't paid well, they aren't yes. paid paid much less compared to um, physical health providers. A physician gets paid much more to prescribe um, uh, an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication than, say, a psychiatrist. And so you end up many mental health care providers on private network, which ends up being much more expensive for individuals. And we know from like NAMI surveys and other surveys that people self-ration care. Mm -hmm. um, and as uh, another viewer asked, what can be done to enforce parity uh, to better access services and appropriate reimbursements from commercial insurance? Well, well great question. Um, and you talked a lot about the issue. That's also important to know that there are uh, not all insurers have to follow parity laws. There's exemptions for medic for, for many Medicare plans, for Medicaid fee for service, um, for some state and local government employee health plans, um, and for uh, individual and group health plans created and purchased before uh, 2010. And so one of the things Congress can do is make sure everyone is included in the parity laws. Um, we also, as I mentioned, have to continue to highlight the fact that there is a cost a cost not just to individuals, but a cost to communities and a cost to, to, to businesses when we don't cover these mental health services before they become uh, crises. We also have to educate the public and uh, we have to educate them that there are steps that you can take if your uh, plan is denying services. You can file an appeal. So speak to your um, mental health professional or provider. Um, if it's an emergency, you have, an, a, right, you have a right uh, to request an expedited um, appeal. Uh, you can confirm with your insurance company that your services will be covered during um, that appeal. And you can uh, have your provider request or request written notification of the reason for denial um, within 30 days. So if you go to NAMI, you mentioned the National Alliance for Mental Illness, uh, NAMI.org. There's more information on parity and the things that you can do as an individual. Uh, I, I want to empower you, but I also want to People don't understand it, we can't put this on individuals alone. We need our leaders to uh, make sure uh, everyone understands the importance of parity. We need accountability for for uh, for businesses that don't um, comply with parity laws. But you hit on a, a point which um, we talk about, but not well, not when we're talking about parity, and that's the workforce, which we began the conversation with. Ritu, um, many uh, of these companies are are not fulfilling their preparity obligations because they have thousands of people in the waiting list and they don't have enough providers or enough resources to provide care. So they simply say, okay, you've been stabilized. I'm going to move my resources to someone on the list who actually has a more acute need. 
and they end up kicking, just stabilizing someone and putting on a Band-Aid and then kicking them, kicking them out, not because they don't want to do the right thing, but because they don't have the resources to deal with everyone um, that, that needs these services. So a big part of this is, is, are the things that we talked about earlier that I don't uh, want to repeat, but but uh, that are going to help increase the 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 workforce and the availability of uh, mental health services um so that it's easier for insurers to say okay i'm not denying someone in acute crisis care by allowing you to stay in your bed um, for an extra week um even though that's the best practice um Congressman Trone talked about uh, Senator Fetterman returning to work and being open about um, his diagnosis, his treatment. Um, Senator Fetterman was just on our airwaves on NPR yesterday talking about this. Um, you mentioned early on that you very openly spoken about your brother's struggles with addiction. So. Um, a question from a viewer is how important is it for public figures sharing their personal experiences with mental illness to help reduce stigma? Uh, it is incredibly important. You mentioned um, I shared my story. I, I, I tweeted out um, um, accolades for Senator Fetterman when he first went into treatment and openly spoke about it because it normalizes this in the same way that someone um, who um, sprains their ankle or has um, some other medical issue um, uh, is, is treated. Uh, I also done a lot of work with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, uh, we're um, leveraging athletes to tell their stories so that we can normalize this because in many cases, um, a Kevin Love talking about his mental health issues um, or a Hall of Fame uh, pro football player um, and, and there are many who I've worked with talking about mental health is going to normalize it in a way that even a Surgeon General of the United States can't normalize talking about mental health. So we need more people talking openly about this. Um, again, you would have no athlete would have a problem saying, yeah, I, I tweaked my knee. I need ACL surgery. Uh, but uh, many people will hide the fact that they're anxious or depressed and needing or, or getting treatment for it. Um, and when they talk about it, then our kids will be more comfortable talking about it. Our workplaces will be more accepting of it and, uh, and we'll be in a better place. But one more important point is that we need more research and public expectation about uh, public education about what expectations for recovery should be. So again, I'm a physician. I can uh, tell you what recovery from your ACL tear is going to look like, how long it's going to take, um, what physical therapy you're going to need, how much work you're going to need to miss, what kind of work you need to do. Uh, we need research, but we also need public and work, workplace education about what recovery from an acute depressive episode looks like, um, from a, a bipolar um, uh, flare-up looks like, um, from uh, what substance use um, disorder treatment and recovery looks like, so that both individuals and workplaces and communities understand that, yes, uh, we can return people to, to function, and these are the supports they're going to need in order to appropriately function in the workplace, but we shouldn't exclude them from the workplace any more than we exclude someone with a broken leg from the workplace. We just make accommodations, and we understand that it's going to be a pathway forward uh, that is going to be beneficial for them and for the workforce if we all work together. Yeah, the supports is really key. Like, again, bringing up like a limb injury, a knee injury, or any other part of your leg. And it's accepted that you're going to need physical therapy for exactly. a while. And you're not going to get back to sort of pre-injury fitness levels and function right away. And you um, may need a ramp in the work to get into your workplace. Or, and or you may need a special equipment, a special chair, or a special desk. But we understand and we accept that for physical health. We don't for mental health to the extent that we could or should. Yeah. Um, now, I know we talked a little bit about prevention before, but there is another question. Um, so I'm going to throw, uh, I'm going to uh, mention it in case you want to add anything else. Uh, the question is, how about taking a proactive approach to preventative mental health care? Um, and, and I briefly mentioned this earlier when I talked about mental fitness. I think we need to do much more research 
into resilience and how we build resilience. And uh, we need to um, help people understand that there are exercises and activities that you can engage in to strengthen your mental health and not just look at it as a crisis or a deficit when people go to the spectrum of mental illness. So I go to the gym, uh, I work out um, my, my, my biceps. Um, and I don't work out my biceps because I'm injured. I don't pay attention to them because I'm injured. I pay attention to them to strengthen them so that they won't become injured. Uh, we can do the same things for our mental health. Um, we can understand our triggers. We can understand so that we don't get hurt mentally, just as we know what things to avoid to get hurt physically. Um, we can strengthen ourselves with meditation, um, or for some people it's sports or it's playing music. These types of things um, increase dopamine in a positive way um, in your brain and can strengthen your mental health. And it can also decrease people's reliance on or tendency to become addicted to dangerous substances. And uh, it's a good time for me to highlight that when I was U.S. Surgeon General, uh, I really focused on a lot of of the mental health um, uh, issues that our country was facing and the negative sequelae. So vaping, I put out an advisory on, uh, on vaping, first Surgeon General's advisory in 10 years, um, uh, warning about the increase in youth vaping. Uh, many youth are vaping to treat anxiety and depression, and then they're becoming addicted and it's creating a vicious cycle. Um, I put out a call to action on suicide prevention, uh, again, speaking to to this uh, to, to this viewer question, uh, we know that there are evidence-based ways, um, and the National Alliance um, has put out these ways in concert with me when I was Surgeon General on on ways that we can uh, identify people at risk for suicide and intervene early on. And uh, I think it's important that we focus on prevention, um, and again, not just on downstream crisis care, uh, because we will never have enough resources to deal with everyone if we wait for them to fall off the cliff. We need to prevent people from falling off the cliff in the first place. I think that's a wonderful place for us to end this discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Adams, um, for this very lively and engaging, informative uh, discussion. And I want to thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for organizing this, for hosting this, and for inviting me to uh, moderate. And thank you for every to everybody watching. Um, and I want to thank you. And uh, I also want to tell people, you can go to uh, NAMI, N-A-M-I.org. You can go to the Bipartisan Policy Committee. They've written several reports, especially if you're a policymaker, on many of these issues, rural health, 988, um, uh, other issues important to the conversation today. There are resources out there. And if we all come together, um, then we actually can create a better world, a more inclusive world, where mental health is seen as critical to overall health. So thank you, Ritu. Thank you so much, Dr. Adams. Bye-bye.